Yes, okay. Well, welcome everybody tonight. It's good to be here with you. And uh, if you got one of these little uh, red pamphlets coming in, put your hand up. Everybody got one of those? Everybody got one? Fantastic. I don't want you to keep it, <laughs> okay? I want you this week or be- between now and Christmas time to go and give it to somebody, okay? So that's your assignment. In fact, I'd love to see you young people uh, get some of those Santa Claus, Santa Claus hats and those little uh, curvy hooks with uh, yellow and white, I think they are, and go down through the uh, shopping centres and just say, Merry Christmas, and uh, here's your little present, okay? I've never had anybody rejected. When I go through McDonald's, I say, Hi, how you doing? You know, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you very much, you know. So look, get them out there. It's the real meaning of Christmas. And I know that God can really use you. And if you want more, and I'd love to think that the whole of the place was blitzed, there's our telephone number on the back. You can ring up the office tomorrow and get some more and just get them out there. And let's show and share the the real meaning of uh, Christmas. Darren, that was a fantastic song. Uh, Darren sings with me all... I've never heard it before. I really enjoyed it, bro. That was fantastic. But he's been with us all around the world. All those places that you've seen... Uh, on the screen there, except Russia. I don't think you were with me in Russia. But uh, all over those places, we had 100,000 people up there in northeast India hearing the gospel and uh, seeing real revival up there. What an exciting time that was. And uh, we're really thrilled to see God working in these places. But we want God to work here tonight. We want God to touch our hearts. Every one of us here tonight, we need a fresh touch from God. Uh, the psalmist could say, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Yeah, okay, thank God for yesterday and the days before. But we want God to touch our lives in a fresh and a new way tonight. Is that what you want? <laughs> You've come to the wrong place if you, if you say, no, this is where it's at tonight. We want God through his word to touch our lives. So when we go out of those doors tonight, we want to be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Country club Christianity is over. We want a faithful few on fire that will take the whole of the Redlands for Jesus Christ. That's what we want. So we're not playing games here tonight. We've come to hear from God. And I pray that you will open your hearts right now. Look, if my fist is closed, I can receive nothing. Uh, But if it's open, I can receive something. And I'm going to ask that we receive something from God tonight. You young people, listen tonight. Uh, This is for you tonight. God wants to use you in a special and a wonderful way tonight. Pray with me, and then we'll come to the Word of God and ask God to touch our lives here tonight in a very wonderful and powerful way. Maybe before we share tonight, just pray a little prayer. I'll be praying it from my heart. You pray it from your heart as well. Uh, Just say, Lord, speak to me. Shall we just pray that silently from our hearts? Lord, speak to me. Our Father and our God, we pray right now as we come to this, your holy, powerful, and precious word, that you would speak to every single one of our hearts. We pray that tonight the Spirit of God might speak to every one of us. And we pray that as we leave here tonight, May people know and see that we have been with Jesus because we ask it in his great and mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'm reading tonight from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 24, uh, verse 36. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, and verse 36. Listen carefully as I read the Word of God. It says this, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. This is not the rapture. This is some being taken away to judgment and others being left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, the other left. 
Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the day uh, your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief were coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now tonight I want to speak a little message on the days of Noah. Jesus said that when he comes, it's going to be <laughs> like the days of Noah. And I want to compare and contrast that to the days in which we live. Uh, Nathan, just flick up those um, couple of uh, slides up on the screen. Uh, Ken Ham has uh, developed an incredible ministry called uh, uh, Answers in Genesis uh, in Kentucky. has built this incredible ark, life-side ark, about uh, the ark that Noah built with his sons. I guess they might have conscripted some other people. It's a, it's a huge, magnificent thing. In fact, it's one of the great <laughs> attractions there in that area of America. Thousands of people are going through this ark. It's absolutely incredible, as you see there. And it's built to scale exactly uh, as, uh, as uh, the dimensions are in the Bible. So thanks so much, uh, Nathan. Appreciate it. <clears throat> but I want to speak about that tonight. The days of Noah. What were they like? And how does that compare to the day and age in which we live? Well, there's three simple metrics I'd like to just look at tonight, just to gauge where we are in these last times. Remember it says in Acts 1-7, But he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set in his own authority. You see, we, haven't, we don't know the, the exact moment that he's going to come, but uh, great events foreshadow themselves. And that's why it's important that we look into the Word of God and we see where we are in time, space, and history. Is Jesus Christ going to come soon? I believe with all of my heart, brothers and sisters tonight, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's coming soon. <laughs> I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the clouds, okay? <laughs> we might not be good looking, but we can be good lookers, looking for the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm waiting for when he comes again. That's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day when Jesus Christ comes again. But what are some of the signs? And if I was going to write another book on the second coming, I'd call it Convergence because the signs are converging greater than ever before and we need to be ready for it. One of the most important signs of the coming again of Jesus Christ is the nation of Israel without a doubt. I've been there several times into Israel. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again in the sight of the United Nations. But it's exactly true to what the Word of God says, that God would bring His people back into the land. And when you go to Israel, you'll hear uh, different uh, uh, languages from all over the world. Isaiah 66, 8, listen carefully. Who has heard such things? Who has ever seen such things like this? Can a country be born in a day and a nation be brought forth in a moment? That's exactly what happened in May 14th, 1948. Israel became a nation again in one day. Ezekiel 36, 24. And I'll take you out of the nations, will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Jeremiah 23, 8. But they will say, but as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of the countries where he has banished them, then they will live in their own land. And Jeremiah 31, verse 8 says this. See, I bring them forth to the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Now, these are critical signs. This is the most important sign. Israel is God's time clock. They're back in the land. They've got their backs against the wall. All the nations around them want to drive them into the sea. But they'll never do it because God has got his hand on the nation of Israel. But here's another one. Uh, the Ezekiel uh, 38, 39 war. Now, if you study Ezekiel 38, well, if you study uh, chapter 37, 
It's really the rebirth again of Israel in a coming day where there's just bones and then flesh comes on the bones, but then the Holy Spirit breathes in and Israel become uh, a nation that's going to worship God again. But you read in Ezekiel 38, 39, and it speaks about the nations like Russia and Iran and Turkey. They're all gathering together, Afghanistan. All those nations are going to come against the nation of Israel in a coming day. I can't believe what happened there in Afghanistan just a little while ago. $90 billion were lost by the American people in that war when they just uh, just pulled out of the whole thing. It's a tragedy. And uh, they had about 208 aircraft that they lost, 75,000 armoured vehicles, 200,000 drones, 600,000 guns, 1,000 night vision goggles, 170 tanks, uh, bundles of cash, uh, 22,000 Humvees, 42,000 trucks, 169 armoured personal carriers. Uh, uh, they've got a, a hundred and, uh, oh, 40 uh, transport planes, a uh, mixed uh, 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 fixed-wing aircraft, 350 combat helicopters, 358 uh, assault rifles, and 64,000 machine guns. It's all there, left of the Taliban, and uh, they're arming themselves. And, of course, a lot of that's gone into Iran, and that'll go into uh, or Iraq and then to Iran, and then ultimately they're weaponing themselves for an invasion into Israel in a coming day. These are important times. All these signs are coming together and we are seeing them with our own eyes. What's going to happen? We're in Ukraine. Those places that you see on the television, Zebrosia, Donetsk, Lugansk, we had meetings there. Uh, thousands of people came into the stadiums and thousands of people came to Jesus Christ. Thank God for what the Christians are doing in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, Franklin Graham is bringing in truckloads of food and supplies and blankets and things uh, to help the people into Ukraine at the moment. But what is going to happen? Is Putin going to back off and let it go? Or is he going to bring another wave of attacks into the people of Iran, but yeah, of uh, the Ukraine? So we don't know what's going to happen there. But we sit back and we watch and we wait and we ought to be taking note of what's happening. But then globalism. You see, that's coming together as, as never before. Uh, before. Klaus uh, uh, Schultz, the, uh, the, uh, the man who uh, is developing the uh, World Economic Forum, and they're meeting every year to work out a way where they can have just a universal state in the world. And that's coming together so, so quickly. All these signs are coming together as never before. Things are not falling apart, but these things are starting to fall together. They're falling into place, indicating to us that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent and we need to be ready. Well, what was it like in the days of Noah? Firstly, spiritual decline. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all of the time. And we see that in, the, in our own nation today. The thoughts of men are only evil continually. And ladies, pray for your husbands. They go out into the workplace. They're mixing with other men, the dirty language, the filthy stories. But we see it on the television right now. We see just how filthy our nation has become. And if you don't think so, well, that means that your conscience is being seared. If you can turn on the television, you see some of the filth and the language there and not be affected. Something is radically wrong with us. And we need to see that uh, there's spirits of decline everywhere. There's social dilemma. We've got a, a population explosion. Big cities breeding... Uh, uh, is a breeding ground for crime and corruption, drug addiction, mental illness, suicide, stress, and hostility. See this happening everywhere. Uh, populations exploding. And then to an increase in crime. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And we see that even in our own city. The first uh, leading stories, usually at night time, about someone's being killed here in Brisbane. So we see that happening everywhere. Shameless depravity. 
at Genesis 6-2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fear, and they chose them wives of which uh, they choose. The sons of God, that's the God in line of Seth, but they started to marry the daughters of men, which is the ungodly uh, line of Cain. And because of that, there was shameless depravity. And we see that happening as well. We see the pornography everywhere on the internet. They're desperately trying to cut it down uh, from Canberra, the, uh, down there. But it's, it's, it's the filth is everywhere. It's Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God's not going to look upon this stuff forever. In, in Romans 1. What does it say? God gave them over. You read through Romans 1. You see the depravity in that time. And God says, I'll I'll give them over. I'm not going to strive with them anymore. And there comes a time when God turns his back on a nation in exactly that same way. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was going through the trials, and they started to pepper him with questions, and he answered them not a word. It's a terrible thing. When God doesn't listen to us anymore, when God turns his back upon us, I pray that it doesn't happen here in Australia, but it may well be. As Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, used to say, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've got the same thing happening in our nation here today. But then there's scientific discovery. Engineering with Tubal, uh, he was smelting iron. Look at our engineering today, the incredible advances there. Economics, there's Jubal, who was a farmer, businessman. There was entertainment uh, with, with uh, Jubal as well. We see the music uh, just being, uh, and the music today, young people, watch the music that you're listening to. It'll either pull you up or pull you down. You've got to be very careful. And then to there's strong delusion, strong delusion, secularism. And then there was supernaturalism. Uh, What does it say? In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. People just going about their only everyday lives, oblivious of God. How many people in Cleveland tonight, in their homes, they're watching the TV, just totally oblivious of God. And then there's supernaturalism too. There's an increase in the occult right now that's sweeping the country in so many areas. But there's going to be some devotion, some devotion. God never leaves himself without a witness. The more desperate the times, the more uh, definite uh, the testimony. 2 Peter 2.5, it says, But he did not spare the ancient world, but he brought the flood upon its ungodly people, but protected Noah as a preacher of righteousness with seven others. So there was this depraved society. But thank God there was a preacher of righteousness who stood up for righteous values. And that's what we need today, righteous values. I think of John Wesley, George Whitfield in England. The the freedom that we have here in this room tonight can be directly attributed to the work that John Wesley and George Whitfield did In England, they went up and down the country just preaching the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole of England uh, turned around to God. Voltaire, with his atheism, uh, uh, pushed it through France, and they went through the bloodbath of the French Revolution. What we need today are preachers that will just take the word of God and preach the word of God. That's why I'm so grateful for, for, for David And the way that he stands firm on the word of God. And I'm praying that uh, Cleveland Baptist Church will be exactly the same. Men and women who stand firmly on the word of God. There's going to be sudden destruction in that day. Jesus said in Matthew 24, And knew not what was about would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. (laughs) They weren't expecting it. They, uh, Enoch just went to be with God. He was just translated, rapture out of the scene. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Jesus Christ will come again. 
He's going to take his church, his body, the believers. They're going to be caught up out of this world. He's coming for his saints. And then later he's going to come with his saints back to reign and to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ, as Darren was singing about tonight. What a glorious, wonderful day that's going to be when we reign with our Lord Jesus Christ. But he's coming soon and we need to be ready for when he comes again. And then to Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God doesn't have favourites, but he does have intimates. People that are prepared to spend time and listen to him. He has that. He was a righteous man. And Noah walked with God. Men, it's possible in a filthy, dirty society for us as men to walk with God. Ladies, walk with God every day. Noah did it. And then he had his call. God told him to build an ark. He heard the call of God. And listen, every one of us here tonight, you've got a call of God on your life. God's got that plan and that purpose for you. Don't mess it up. The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you discovered why you were born. God's got a plan. He's got a purpose for you, and you not, might be, not be listening to that plan, but he's got a plan and a purpose for every single one of our lives. And there's his converts, <laughs> which was his family, and that's what we need to be praying constantly for all the time, that our families come to the Lord Jesus Christ, constantly praying for our families, maybe our children and our grandchildren. We need to be constantly praying for them as well. Well, I want to take a few moments now just to compare and contrast the, the ark that Noah built and the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and how similar they really are. Hebrews 11 says this, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark, what? To save his family. That's why we've got to work on it. You've got to be praying that God will save your family. I see those little babies. You've got to be praying those little ones come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He built the ark for the saving of his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. How are they the same? Well, the cross is like Noah's ark in its purpose. His purpose was to save people from the flood. Well, the cross is to save men from eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the sin question. That's why he died. Christ died for our sin. If our sin is not forgiven, we'll never get to be with God in his heaven. Tonight, is your sin forgiven? Do you really know that tonight? That your sin has, as you've been to the cross, knelt under the drippings of Calvary and said, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross, being nailed to that cross, suffering for six agonizing hours. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing that, dying for me. Have you been to the cross? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins, because you'll never get to heaven. I say this tonight, you will never get to heaven unless your sin is forgiven. And the only place our sin can be forgiven is at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been to the cross, we've got to have our sin forgiven. <laughs> My, I had a beautiful sister called Kathleen, and uh, she contacted cancer to go to visit her in the hospital. And little bit by little bit, I could see the cancer slowly eating and taking a life away. And it was just breaking my heart. I thought, if only I could put my life into her life and take that cancer out of her life and put it into me. But I couldn't do it. But you see, friends, tonight, that's what Jesus did. When he died on that cross... All the judgment, the penalty, the punishment for my sin and for your sin, Jesus Christ bore all of that 
on the cross. He died for you so that you might live eternally with him. That was his plan. Of course, the cross of Christ, like Noah, it was like, uh, the cross is like Noah's ark in its planning. Lots of planning. Noah, it wasn't Noah's idea. God told him how to do it. It was, a, it was 155 meters long, you saw it there tonight, 26 meters high, uh, wide rather, and it was, went, had four stories, so it could easily accommodate all that it was quite required to do in its planning. But God and the cross was the planning of God. Listen to what the Word of God says carefully. Do you not know that... Uh, <laughs> Don't you know that you're not uh, redeemed with perishable things such as silver and gold, but from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Planned. Everything was planned meticulously, even on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were talking over about his demise. Everything was planned. You think that Pilate was in control? No, no, no. Everything was planned by the foreknowledge of God. God planned it all. And as I said before, listen, God has a plan for your life. Don't miss out on that plan. He's got a plan for you. But then to the cross is like Noah's Ark in its provision. Store for 375 days. He had, they had plenty of food. Uh, Ken Ham shows that when you go through the ark that he's built there in Kentucky. But the cross has got all the provision that we need. There's blood enough to cleanse every person in the world from their sin. There's pardon enough to pardon everyone that's ever sinned against God. There's power enough for every person in this world. Power enough for you tonight. You can be victorious. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, who always leads us forward in triumphant procession, Paul said. We have that victory through Christ and his power. There's grace enough, there's mercy enough to meet every one of our needs. Jesus Christ, listen to me tonight, will supply every one of your needs. I'm old, I've been young, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God's going to look after you through every phase and part of your life. The cross is like Noah's Ark in its protection. The rain and the flood could not touch them in that boat. It was wild. It must have been a wild trip. But these winds and the rains couldn't touch them. And Calvary, too, protects us from the judgment of God. Calvary is the way that protects you from sitting under the judgment of God. I think about if you're about to walk across the road, and as you step off the curve, there's this huge cement truck coming down the road, and you don't see it. But there's a young guy behind you, and he sees exactly what's happening. And he comes and he pushes you, and he pushes you out of the way of the truck. And the truck just runs over that young guy and kills him. He's giving his life for you. But that's exactly the provision of God. Jesus Christ provided for you when he died on that cross. He gave his life so that you might live. The cross is like Noah's Ark in its invitation, not forced. The invitation went out to come, get inside the ark. They said no, and there might be someone here tonight saying, well, I hear what you're saying, Bill, but not yet. I'm not going to give my life to you yet, God. I'm going to live my own life and do what I want to have fun. I want to do my own thing. What do you call fun? Blistering God's pure air with their soul withering curses? What do you call fun? (laughs) Telling your dirty stories and your smutty jokes? What do you call fun? When you come to Jesus Christ, that's when life really begins. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, It's a wonderful thing to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God won't force you. He didn't force them onto the ark. He'll not force you. You've got to make your own decision tonight to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to the cross of his like Noah's ark in its entrance. If you see the ark up there, there's only one door 
And Ken made that very specific. I just want one door into the ark. And the animals and the people had to go through that one door. And there's only one way. So you come to the cross, we acknowledge we're sinners before God, and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Listen to me tonight. The distance between heaven and hell is the distance between your head and your heart. And there are numbers of you here tonight, and you've got it up here. Because you've been to church, you know the language, you sing the songs. It's up here. But it's not here. You've got to have Jesus Christ living supreme in your heart if you truly want of the salvation of God. It's like I go out to the airport and I decide to take a plane down to Sydney like I will be shortly and, and um, I get the ticket. I believe the plane can take me there, but I'm not on the plane. I wait in the waiting area till they finally announce I'm sitting there waiting. I believe it can take me, but I'm not on the plane. And then I get up, I hear a call. I walk over to the little tunnel that goes down to the plane. I'm walking down the tunnel I believe I can go to Sydney, but I'm not on the plane. Until ultimately I come to the plane door and I take that step into the plane and I entrust my life to the pilot, the crew and the plane. That's what it means to believe, to entrust your life completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, have you done that? Are you sure tonight? If you died at this moment in time, are you 100% certain that you'd go to be with God in his heaven. Say, Bill, I hope so. Not good enough. You've got to know so, and you can tonight. He that has the Son has eternal life. The cross is like Noah's ark in its control. Think with me now. The ark, did you see a rudder on that ark? It had no rudder, no control, because God was in control of the whole thing. And it's exactly the same way with us. When we come to Jesus Christ, you surrender the control of your life to him. So many Christians want to control their own life and, you know, do what they want to do. All the, No, no, no. When we surrender our whole lives to Jesus Christ, he's the one that will guide you and lead you through life day by day. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an own God. The cross is like Noah's Ark in its preservation. No one was lost in the ark. And no one was lost when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 5, who through faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is already revealed in the last of time. Our Lord says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. The cross is like Noah's Ark in its opportunity. Only one opportunity. Some would have been right at the door of the ark, but they couldn't get in. The door was closed. Some might have been miles away. Some were very close. I think of those soldiers around the cross of Christ, that man with a javelin driving it up into the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ through his stomach. Blood coming out, splashing on him. He is close. And some of you tonight are close. You're very close. But you haven't really entrusted your life totally and completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. (coughs) Someday soon, God's going to close the door. (laughs) I can't wait for that to happen. Because we're going to live gloriously, as Darren was singing tonight, gloriously with him in a day to come. Because (laughs) there was blood that was put over the door, Jesus shed his blood so that you and I can come to him. And it's exclusive in its claims. There wasn't a bunch of arcs that you could jump on that day. One ark. It's all that there is. And Jesus Christ said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes under the Father but by me, only one way. Well, how does that affect us today as we live our lives day by day? Well, firstly, we've got to watch. Don't have your head in the sand. Look about what's happening around you. Watch. And then, too, we have to wait patiently. And then we are to work closely with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to work for it to occupy till he comes again. 
And we had to wake up, wake up. I heard about a teacher one time who would come into the classroom. He'd put a tennis ball on the, on the table. And uh, the students would come in and sit down. <coughs> they didn't know what that was for. After a few days, one of the students nodded off to sleep. So he took the, the tennis ball and with pinpoint accuracy, he threw the tennis ball, hit the kid right in front of the head and uh, <laughs> woke up the kid. Well, the next day he came in. He didn't have a tennis ball. He had a cricket ball. <laughs> and nobody went to sleep. Okay. This is no time to go to sleep. We are to watch and we are to wait. So we need to get packed up, prayed up, and get ready to be picked up. <laughs> because the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Are you ready? I think of another boat that was trusted one time. <coughs> it was called the Titanic. Sailing out of Ireland. And uh, it was to go to America. They wanted to have a record run because uh, they just wanted to show how wonderful this boat was. Until it got halfway across and uh, it hit an iceberg. and ripped open under the, uh, under the sea line and it went down. And it was going down. And uh, there was a guy called John Harper. He was a wonderful Christian. He was a ev Scottish evangelist. And uh, he's saying to this one, look, are you saved? Are you born again? You see, the boat's going down. <laughs> no time for niceties and building bridges. Are you born again? Are you saved? Have you got eternal life? And then uh, he put his little daughter into one of the lifeboats. She later on married a pastor. But um, he's thrown into the water. And in the icy waters of the Atlantic, he's swimming to different people. Are you saved? Are you born again? Have you got eternal life? And uh, <coughs> then he started to freeze up. He said, oh, no. He said, he said I'm, I'm going down. I'm going down. But then this beautiful smile come across his face. He said, no. He said, I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm going up. Where are you going? Let's make sure of it tonight. Let's make sure right now that we've got eternal life. Young people, men tonight, ladies, want to pray a short prayer, phrase by phrase. And as I pray the prayer, pray it with me. Simple prayer. But mean it from your heart of hearts. Jesus Christ will forgive your sins. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. And you can go out of this building tonight with great joy in your heart. Let's bow for prayer. Would you do that with me, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're in the presence of God. The Lord is here. Say this silently from your heart. God will hear it. He knows what you're thinking right now. He'll hear the prayer. Just say this from your heart tonight. Silently, dear Lord Jesus Christ, Tonight I come to you. I thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross to forgive my sins. Lord Jesus, right now I fully entrust my life to you. Help me to be the person you want me to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving to me the gift of eternal life. 